Um, good morning. I'm Sue Swider. I'm from Rush University uh, here in Chicago, actually just a couple of blocks away. What I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about some of the things we've been doing in nursing education around looking at the uh, teaching nurses to assess and address the social determinants of health and move the healthcare system towards health equity. A lot of the work that's been done in nursing education for the last decade has been inspired by the Affordable Care Act, but also by this report. If you're not familiar with this report, it's an IOM report from 2013. The depiction on the screen will kind of show you it, it does not end well for the United States. It says shorter lives, poorer health. So it's not a positive depiction of U.S. healthcare outcomes. What it does is it compares outcomes in the United States to peer countries, countries that look like us uh, economically, and we don't fare well, particularly given how much money we spend. So the report details a number of reasons for this, but one of the things that really comes out is that many of the other countries that have better overall population health outcomes do a better job with the social safety net. They just look more broadly at the factors that address, that cause health and illness. The county health rankings is my favorite model for looking at this as well. Really, we talk in the, in the county health rankings models about all the things that impact health outcomes. And you can see from here that 80% of those things are not clinical care. So while I think we've always worked very hard in nursing at being excellent clinical clinicians and providing excellent clinical care, clearly when you think about those mediocre outcomes, we're, we're missing something. We're missing all of this other 80%. So nursing education started to look at this at least a decade ago and say, what is it that we need to be doing as we educate students to help them address some of these missing factors? We used kind of the term population health as a proxy for looking at social determinants, trying to achieve health equity, addressing health disparities. And I have the Kindigan Stoddard old definition really population health being looking at outcomes across populations and how they're distributed within the population. For us in nursing education, or for many of us, it's boiled down to social and environmental determinants of health, um, looking at disease prevention, looking at coordinating care both inside and outside of, of healthcare institutions, and population management. So we really tried to look at this concept of population health across the care continuum. So not just where you might automatically think it, it falls in public health, but really what, does, what do these population health skills bring to you in the ambulatory care setting or in the acute care setting? What is it that would be helpful there that would really help move the needle on changing health care outcomes? So this is a little bit of what nursing's done here. I have lots and lots of um, links so that you can find this. But some of what nursing's done is there's been two reports out of NACNEP, the National Advisory Council on Nursing Education and Practice. The first one is on public health nursing, and you say, well, why just public health? Well, first of all, I'm a public health nurse, and I got to put it up there. But um, <laughs> secondly, it's because I think public health nursing has addressed a lot of this for a long time. So I really think in nursing it behooves us to look to our public health those within us that work in public health, because a lot of this, how you address the social determinants, how you look at rates and epidemiology, and is things that are in public health's wheelhouse, and we have content and skills we can share with the rest of nursing. The second NACNEP report was population health specific. What are new nursing roles in population health? In addition, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, which is one of our large academic organizations for um, higher education and nursing, baccalaureate and higher, and they uh, represent almost 90% of all the baccalaureate and higher schools in terms of their membership. So they have quite an influence. Um, they have had essentials for nursing at the baccalaureate, masters, and DNP level for years. And those essentials have always had content in population health and public health in there. So it's always been a piece of the concepts we talk about as important to, to nurses. So if we're not conveying that um, impactfully enough to our students, why is that? And I'll get back to that in a little bit. And then last, the Healthy People Curriculum Task Force, the word force fell off my slide, um, is a group of people from medicine, nursing, pharmacy, um, public health, veterinary medicine, looking at what healthcare professionals need to know that comes out of healthy people. And nursing's been very involved in that work, and we actually disseminate and use this work with our, with our nursing schools. 
Additionally, there's been nursing-specific work on the social determinants of health. There's an IOM report that came out a couple of years ago on what do all health professionals need to know about the social determinants, and we've been spreading that with our uh, nurse colleagues at university level. And then the National League of Nursing, just this spring, the National League of Nursing is another one of our major academic institutions that uh, their members represent the gamut of education and nursing. Just this spring came out with a vision statement on the social determinants of health in nursing education. And what they said is it's, it's a tool. It's a tool to really working towards eliminating health disparities and achieving health equity and attaining social justice, which have always been core values of nursing. In addition to those kind of white papers and documents, AACN has had funding from the Centers for Disease Control now for seven or eight years. Part of a collaborative, CDC funds health profession schools to look at public and population health curriculum. So they fund the um, Association of Medical Colleges, the Schools of Public Health, and APTR. The funding they've provided AACN for the last seven years um, has done something with the goals that I have here. It's to strengthen the public health nursing workforce. It's to really enhance curriculum in what I talked about as population health. And it's to encourage nursing schools to provide really robust community experiences um, that help students see population health, health disparities, et cetera, as part of their nursing education. AACN has done a lot of things with this money. I don't have nearly enough time to go through all of them, and so I will totally leave off the ones that are directly related to public health nursing. But the ones that are in population health I've listed here. A lot of faculty development. There's been webinars. There's some white papers on the AACN website on teaching population health. There's some exemplar schools out there. Um, we've been able to fund DNP projects across the country where DNPs are doing scholarly work as part of their degree in population health uh, issues. We've been able to fund faculty small evaluation projects. So when faculty are doing work in non-traditional settings with their students, oftentimes they don't have the opportunity or the money to evaluate the impact on both the students and the community, so we've been able to fund some of that. Um, we've created population health learning hubs. There's four of them now across the country, and these are schools of nursing that join together with local health departments and at least one non-health community organization to address a health issue in the community. So we have four learning hubs that are in process. And then we've been working with the Practical Playbook and the Camden Coalition around curricular innovations that we can share with nursing faculty. In addition, we've done something that's near and dear to my heart because I've been part of it, um, and it's been to try to look at, remember I mentioned that the essentials were very broad and conceptual. So at Rush, we might teach population health in one way, and at Loyola on the west side of Chicago, they teach it another way, and we don't have any measures that guarantee that students are coming out, new nurses are coming out, with a particular set of skills and abilities in this area. We can't say all nurses, could, for example, could assess and address the social determinants of health. We can't, it's not like saying every nursing student, you know, when they graduate can take a blood pressure. We don't have that kind of a measure. So we did some work with developing a small vignette through AACN um, to try to measure some competencies in population health. We piloted it with 3,400 students across a large number of nursing programs and found that this vignette, just by itself, was valid and reliable and it looked like progression through the curriculum was correlated with how well students did on the vignette. So that's good, but it's a little tiny vignette. We need a lot more of this kind of work to look at what are those skills we want students to have, to have some consensus on that, and then how do we measure them. I want to talk about a second project that um, is through AARP and the Center to Champion Nursing in America, and this is called Population Health Nursing one, because there is a two. Um, we call it FIN1, and a shout out to my FIN1 people who are listening somewhere. Um, what this project was, was designed to do is to look at promising educational models that would teach nurses about population health. And we started out with doing a series of surveys and then moved to in-depth interviews with leaders in medicine, nursing, and public health to say, what do you think nurses need to know in this area? Um, how would we measure the success or how would we measure their competency? What are uh, benefits to this knowledge? What are challenges to this? Um, and how, what are the best ways to teach it? And then we picked six schools that we heard over and over again from our interviewees to go and that had promising practices to go and do site visits. And one of them was my own Rush, so shout out to Rush. Um, 
results from this project, I won't go through all of them, but we looked at, again, core content, and core content included being able to assess and address the social determinants, a little bit of epi, um, understanding a little bit about healthcare economics and how the way we fund services impacts both the services we provide and outcomes, some systems thinking, looking at health equity as a goal. So there was a fair amount of consensus around those content areas. We also had some consensus around um, teaching methods, case studies and simulation. Interprofessional education was huge as an important teaching method. Um, and some service learning and structured academic practice partnerships. The benefits to this, people, the people in our study thought were that it had the potential to both impact students and the communities they worked in. And the barriers were significant. They were a lack of measures for ultimate student competencies, a lack of agreement on competencies and measures. They were a lack of um, work on measuring whether it did indeed impact populations, and also a lack of prepared faculty, particularly to look at this across the continuum. So we had a lot of public health faculty, but when you're trying to look at population health across the continuum of care, we had fewer faculty with expertise to see how that translated to their settings. Um, we decided from FIN1 that we should try to disseminate this information. So there is a report that you can get at on the web. Um, I'm here today talking about it. We're trying to disseminate it to as many nursing organizations as possible. We really want to look at that competency measurement I talked about and continue to look at IPE models for teaching population health. And then we've moved into FIN2. And FIN2 is going to look at the academic practice partnership side from the practice end. So we looked at schools of nursing. Now we're going to look at models in the community that have particular um, potential for being able to teach students. So this is the things I think we need to do. And there's, I will not say that this is a holistic view of everything going on in nursing education. I know, for example, Odin, um, the associate degree nursing organization, and I know Donna's here, did their whole um, work, their whole annual conference last year around population health. I know there's a lot of work going. This is just the work that I'm most familiar with that I thought you all should be familiar with. Um, and as we move into the future, the AACN essentials are under revision. So that's a good opportunity to really make them more robustly reflect population health content. And in fact, some of us here are on the revisions task force, and we have a special group looking at population health. We really need to look at those competency measures and tools. Um, faculty development is critical. We need to keep developing and testing new models um, to see if what's the role of nurses in population health and what's the value added of having nurses in these models. And then we need to look at robust continuing education for our current, nur current, current nursing workforce. It is terrific to bring new nurses in with the skills and knowledge we think they need for this evolving healthcare and to try to move the needle on health outcomes. But we have a, that, that's a long, slow way to change. We have a lot of current nurses that we need to think about what we can do to up their um, knowledge and skills to help them work better with their patients across the care spectrum. Thanks very much.